Thank you very much, you know, Ronen, for the nice invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Shared ledgers is a dream infrastructure, right? Everybody can read, everybody can write. Eventually, nobody can change what has been written. We totally agree on that. The real question, however, is how is the best implemented? How to best implement it so that it can really reach its full potential? So there is a Bitcoin and a proof of work on one side, and I would like to describe Algorand on another side. Then the interesting thing is that even though these approaches are dramatically different, they do share some very basic cryptography, digital signature and random hashing. So that is not a problem. So everybody knows uh, uh, Bitcoin. Communication is via gossiping. And uh, the analysis actually is uh, not uh, exactly trivial. Pass and, Sh and uh, Shalata did actually a very good job on analyzing it, in my opinion. And the main idea is a consensus via proof of work that you all know. And the main assumption is the honest majority of computing power for the miners. So nonetheless, there are some main technical problems. These are no problems that I point out. These are problems that everybody knows too. So one is the wastefulness of electricity, cost, fees, and everything else, which remind us that when we were digging from gold, at the end we were proud owner of a big hole there, right? Not much progress. We should be better than that. $50,000 uh, per block every 10 minutes is a billion dollar of operation every year. Nobody can afford it, really, certainly not in all developing economies. Then there is another problem, which is an exogenous concentration of power. We wanted a distributed ledger and a distributed cryptocurrencies. And somehow, somewhere else, the power is concentrated, and not exactly in the people who own the money, but in these other, other things. Five mining pools controlling the flow of money in the world is unprecedented, and I don't believe it's going to fly. And again, can be alleviated. But uh, to a point, you know, uh, pass and she. Then uh, there is also, uh, I mean, I'm a cryptographer by training. And so I believe that I have a realistic look at the world. Somebody uh, um, accuses me of pessimism. <laughs> I think it's very realistic. So I think that it's not only exogenous, uh, but uh, in, in, in concentration of power, but also in vulnerability. These miners have low profit margins. They are very known. We have some pseudonymity unless you use Zcash in, in, uh, in our chains. But the miners, everybody knows who, who they are. At least they are electrical companies in their, in their uh, um, uh, countries know where they are because they suck so much energy from the network. And you know, you put one and two together, you know where they are, the low profit margins, you know, the danger is really of, uh, uh, of easy corruption so that to invalidate all the, um, the security that the blockchain has. And finally, scalability, I mean, uh, it's not clear that this approach is scale, how about a million users, not a million keys, but a really a million user transacting, how about the 10 million, 100 million, and so on and so forth. And then finally, there is ambiguity in the form of forks. Here is an extreme form of forks. And so, as you, can, as you know, the financial uh, world hates ambiguity. They have enough risk as it is. And the notion that somehow a block with your payment in it may disappear may give you a heart, a heart attack to, um, to many of us. So what happens is that, you know, to say, well, OK, if you want to, want to uh, sleep uh, comfortably, wait. Maybe you wait for being three deep, six deep, 20 deep. You know, but at some point, this has a very heavy impact on latency. And the true latency of this system is very long. So it doesn't scale. There are few transactions um, per second. And uh, moreover, there is a, a long uh, a true latency. I think that we have enough on this uh, plate of problems to try to do a bit better. So, so let me tell you about Algorand, how does it contrast with this picture. Algorand is based on effortless, one by one, Byzantine agreement. Let me guide through this, you know, uh, very lightly. Let's start with effortless and one by one. Okay, behold the first block. 
come on, the first block is easy to agree on, right? Is the Genesis block, we decide whatever we want to write in it, everybody knows it. Okay, so the problem is to agree on the block number two and three and four, block a million, et cetera, et cetera. So here is the first block, and on the right, which is for free, essentially, on the right there is the favor, a favor, the universal or a universal symbol of lightness. So, and as the favor gently goes down, what do you want that these blocks are generated in a linear fashion? So wait a second, what happened to forks? What happens to forks of work? Nothing. Why? Because in algorithm there are no forks and there is no proof of work. That's the whole thing. So what you are left with is a very clean single blockchain the way it was intended to be. Now, how do we achieve a single blockchain with no fork? By Byzantine agreement. So let me remind you what that is. Is a communication protocol. Is invented in the 80s. Uh, very powerful concept. So it's a communication protocol such a way that when the majority of the players are honest, it guarantees two properties. One, agreement. What does this mean? That if you take the end players, and some of them are malicious, you can see by yourself which ones are malicious there, and if they start even with different value, values, at the end of a the conversation, they must agree on the same value. Can this be a default value? Sure. Can it be always at zero the value we agree on? Sure. But there is a second property, which is consistency. That means that if in the case in which they start with the same value, then they ought to agree on that value, not a default value. Right? So everybody agrees on the same thing, and if they start with the same thing, they ought to agree on that. Now, what is the analogy here? I want you to think about this way. Assume an honest person, user, proposes a new block. Right? If it is an honest user, you are going to, it's going to distribute the same block to everybody. So we ought to agree on the block proposed. If the proposer is dishonest and sends different blocks to Thailand, Italy, and so on and so forth for each one of us, then it doesn't matter. Because by Byzantine agreement, we are going to agree on a default block, possibly the empty block. Says we don't, there is no transaction this time around. So it sounds you know, that we are on the road track. This technology is in the 80s, well understood, developed. Why don't we just plug it in as I just did with my computer? Well, there are the two challenges. First of all, the traditional Byzantine agreement protocols were very slow. And you know, we want speed, we want performance, we want a real scale. And second of all is that uh, the players are actually fixed and known in advance. Well, on the internet, nobody's fixed, and <laughs> certainly nobody's known in advance. People join in all the time. And in fact, they were so slow that in the typical um, um, applications, people envisaged four players, somebody envisaged 12. We have to envision here, you know, millions. Uh, it's, it's not going to work. So there are some challenges. But you can see that conceptually is very, very appealing. All right, so let me give you, I told you a little bit of what the bases are. The summary, the grand summary is like this. Communication is again by gossiping. The main idea is to use a message passing Byzantine agreement. And the main assumption is an honest majority of money, that the, the majority of the money in the system is owned by easy and honest hands. So what are the technical advantages contrasting them with the one of the previous approach of, of Bitcoin, say? First of all, trivial of computation. Define trivial. Well, a few additions. We want to count a few things. Compare two integers. Sign something or verify something. Nothing to write home about. The second one is true decentralization. That's what we wanted, uh, ladies and gentlemen. A single class of users, no exogenous powers, no miners, no nothing else that is not one of us. So we are really the true and power citizen of this system. Third, finality of payments. Why are payments final? Because in Algorand, every block produced, you can rely on it immediately. It's not an eventual consensus protocol in which you have to elongate the chain, there are competing chains, the longest wins, the, uh, all the rest is sooner or later die. No, you see a block, you can bet on it right away. 
Well, I'm not saying that there are no forks, as I'm indicating that forks are very rare. How rare? If they can occur with probability 1 over 10 to the 18. That's a strange number. Well, let me tell you what 10 to the 18 is, according to our friends, the physicist, is the number of seconds that elapsed since the Big Bang till now. So if you produced a block a second, which would be a very good clip of blocks, you had to wait, essentially, the age of the universe to see a fork. You know, basically we can tolerate, particularly if a fork we can solve it in 10 minutes. The other thing is scalability. So somehow, really, the bottleneck in Algorand is how fast you can circulate, propagate a block. Because if you are a distributed system, the only way to propagate a block is really to pass it around. So that is going to take some time. But there is no other time, like that in Bitcoin, necessary to prevent that somehow the riddle is solved so fast so that we are going to have forks galore. That is the only true, essentially, bottleneck. And the other one is security. And security against a bad adversary. How bad? Very bad. But fear not. We are here to defend you, OK? So let me tell you what a bad adversary can do. You know, can immediately corrupt any player he wants, provided that he can corrupt more of a third of the internet. That's OK. But immediately. And after that, he totally controls and perfectly coordinates all the bad players. They become zombies at his uh, orders and disposal and organizes them perfectly. And he can do also a, a, a bunch of other things, send good messages uh, before, uh, after seeing the good ones, uh, and so on and so forth, but cannot forge signatures. That is OK. Not even a national state can forge signature if the signature scheme is strong. Right? I'm going to say. Do we have to believe, to assume such an adversarial network? Can't we just rely only on incentives? It's not in the interest of the adversary to break the system because there's little to gain. Come on, guys. Right in 2001, you know, a bunch of people, 18, 19 of them, plunged themselves against the Twin Towers of a lot of innocent people. What do they have to gain? If you have something of value, with about really billions of dollars, with the civilized world rely on it, it's going to be attacked. So it would be insane of us not to prepare against such a thing. And it's always better to prepare for the worst, particularly if we can actually tolerate the worst and withstand it securely. So of course it's going to take more to, to corrupt somebody than just pointing, oops, now you work for me, oops, now you work for me. But let's assume it does. If we can prove that not even this can help our adversary, then so much the better. Let me share with you the architecture. There are some 20 minutes uh, and change here, so I'm going to be very brief. What I'm going to show is that there are some blocks. They are going to get on top of each other, looks to shake a little bit until we put the keystone, and that's it. That's it. I'd like to share you how, at a high level, things work. How each block is done is going to be a different talk with <laughs> more time, and we'll do another time, right? But we can at least discuss this at a high level. And let's do it right away. Here we are at the highest level. There are millions and millions of people out there, of users, wherever they can fit. And no surprise, a lot of them are bad ones, but say not in a majority, right? By the way, I believe that in society, the majority is honest. And I can prove it, proof. Societies exist. If in a society nobody follows the rules and everybody goes against the rule, so it would be in a jungle, it's not a society, it's a totally different atmosphere, right? So the point is that however there are bad guys, maybe 1%, 2%, 10%, 15%, 20%, but you know, they're not going to be in a majority. And we don't know who they are. But so here is how Algorand works. And I'm going to describe it at a high level by magic. And since I can invoke magic, what does the magician, Algorand the magician do? Selects one user at random. And in this particular case, as you can see, happen to have selected an honest user. Moreover, the identity of this honest user, by magic, again, is known to the entire world. It's universally made clear. OK? What does this uh, lucky person here do? He's in charge of producing the next block. 
block of B1, B2, BR are in existence now. He proposes a new block of BR plus one by putting all the valid transactions not yet appearing in the blockchain that he can see. And then he propagates, he gossip to, to the world. Done that, by magic again, you select a thousand people. And be, right now, and now when you talk about the physical, you are bound to find at least some bad guys because a thousand people is a lot. And what to do with small group of a thousand people do? What do they do? They run Byzantine agreement on the block proposed by the first person. Why? Just in case he or she was dishonest and propagated different blocks to different people. So you want to catch this opportunity in eliminating by running true legitimate Byzantine agreement on it. And then what do they do? Each one, one is going to be in Asia, two in Oceania, um, uh, a few over here, right? Obviously 1,000 people disperse. That's a distributed protocol. You produce your own output on the computer. But now you know that everybody else who is honest among the first people has the same output that you do. By mathematics, not by magic this time. This protocol has a proof. And so what do you do? You digitally sign the hash of the block you just approved, and you propagate it to the network. Assume now you are an observer. And you see that there is one block floating around the network signed by 750 of the thousand guys that by magic you already know are part of this committee. What do you deduce? Ladies and gentlemen, that's the new block. You can rely on it right away. All right, that's it. So one person is chosen at random and proposes a block. A thousand people are chosen at random and are universally known by magic. They agree on the block, they certify the block. Okay, okay. Jay, gee, that is simple, but uh, I guess that there, is a, there are some legitimate Q&A to make. And uh, let me go forward and propose three equations that I hear a lot whenever uh, I speak about this. And we are going to answer them. And in the answer, you know, we expect to take a few rabbits out of the hat because of this problem now, distributed ledgers have been around for 15 years, right? And a lot of people have looked at it, so we have to do something extravagant. Otherwise, we are not going to be here describing a new system. So one question that I hear is a lot is, is gee, I like your idea of a small committee, a, a thousand, right? Because it can be, by the way, there can be billions of users. The committee is always a thousand. That's why the system scales, okay? So, but who selects the committee? Right, because I'd love to be selected by committee. And the answer is a little bit bizarre because it says each committee member actually seg secretly selects himself. It says, gee, that is the worst thing I ever saw. Right, because if I select myself, I select myself all the time. I want to be in every committee. What's the catch? The catch here that to be part of a committee, I must run my own lottery. And this is a cryptographic special lottery which has a more important property that I cannot cheat no matter what I do and no matter how many computational resources I have. But if I win my lottery, I, have, I can prove it to you. I obtain a lottery winning ticket that I can prove it to you. So what I do is that I propagate my winning ticket uh, so that you know that now I'm part of this committee. Pause here for a second. How long did it take to elect 1,000 people in this way? How much time? You know what? Zero. Why? Can you imagine a billion people agree on anything? It's hard to agree on a block. It's hard to agree on 1,000 people. But here, these people select themselves by running inside their own computer this lottery, which is extremely simple. So in, in a million of a second, you know if you're one or not, and you, if you want, you elect yourself, done. No discussions, okay? All right, you have elected your uh, thousand people committee. Thank you very much. But you know, didn't you say that that was very slow? Yeah, it was slow. And, but why can I use it? Because I designed a different protocol for doing Bison agreement. You see, the traditional protocols in Byzantine agreement had to work, were not only deterministic, but had to work 
as many rounds of communication as potentially there are bad people. So if there is a thousand people in the committee and there are a hundred, say 10% bad people, then you have to go talk a hundred and plus one time. And instead, what is this super fast? Super fast means in the worst case is an expected nine steps. Actually, if the block proposer happens to be honest, which most of the time is going to be because most of the people are honest, it takes four steps only. But if it's dishonest, it's try to confuse people, ah, nine steps. Now, nine steps is more, but what goes on in a step, right? Because if each in a step we had to move mountains, you know, nine steps, nine mountains to move uphill, that's a, that's a tough. Easy. In one step, all you have to do is to propagate a single short message. So can we afford the nine steps? Yes. Proof. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, done. We're done. We have our block. Okay? Not bad. Third question. But, you know, there is a very, very subtle thing here. Did you say that it could take four steps between four and nine steps? And uh, didn't you say that your adversary, because we have to be really realistic, could corrupt anybody who wants it almost instantly? Well, why can't he corrupt you know, all the people in the committee? And the answer is because we are going to use different committee to run each of either four or nine steps. Let me tell you why this is Nonsense. Well, first of all, let me tell you what the good things. Sorry, I'm hiding on myself. A committee member essentially speaks only once. He provides his winning proof with lottery ticket and his message. But you say nine steps, so when I want to talk of the first step, the adversary is up in arms, looking very closely with binoculars all over the world to see who are these, these are some people. I want to corrupt them all. But, you know, he doesn't know because we have, have our lottery ticket inside the computer. Once I show you the lottery ticket, not only I show it that I'm part of the committee, but I also propagate my first message in the protocol, in the Byzantine group. I propagate the pair. Now the adversary knows that I'm part of the committee and zap, he corrupts me right away. Too late, because my first message is already virally propagating and he cannot take it back, no more than NSA can take back a message by WikiLeaks, who has been virally propagating over the network. Gee, but you said that there are nine steps, possibly. So even though my first message is OK, the second message, I am already corrupted. And the third message also, right? So in other words, that is a real danger. And you say, but, but you know, I propagate a different, different committee for each step. So but this is nonsense. Why is nonsense? Because what is a protocol? A protocol is a kind of intelligent conversation. Can you imagine an intelligent conversation between, say, the 100 of us here? It works like this. We say a message, arrives an adversary, zzz, guns us all down, all dead. No problem. We bring even another random 100 people, and they say the second message. But the adversary comes, kills everybody again. No problem a different hundred people walking in the same room and say the third message. What kind of intelligent conversation we can have this way? I don't think it's going to be very intelligent at all. Well, certain things you can do in this model, let me tell you, for instance, one. Here is the following one. Assume that all we want to do is to announce a random number between one and a hundred, okay? So in step one, we present, you say, 27, 72, 43, done. Sorry, we are all corrupted. But do new 100 people come in and they start saying 98, uh, 53. Do we care if they are the same people than before or not? No. Why? Because we're giving numbers at random. But here we have to do something intelligent, which is a Byzantine agreement protocol. And so that is, comes the idea of a player replaceability. So the, the super duper. Byzantine protocol, not only so them fast, but actually as a property which is really, I couldn't predict having been in the field for 40 years. 
which, which, is, which means that the protocol can be run correctly even though a totally different set of players who have nothing to do with one another participates in different rounds. So even though you corrupt something, it doesn't help you, okay? And, uh, you know, I'd like to, that's a new brand property, and I'd like to tell you at least an example of something that people always wanted to do that it can be done in, uh, in, uh, in this fashion. Here is, a, here is a, a good metaphor. So remember that I've been speaking here for 20 minutes, and uh, it's been a hard uh, battle against the adversary. Our flag, however, proudly still flutters, even though it's a little bit you know, damaged. But who cares? We are going to move our, our colors across the field and clear the field for the enemy. The enemy, of course, is going to defend himself. It's his last stance. It's a very strongly entrenched position. All right? Let's see what happens. Protocol charge. We won. Okay. Notice what happened, okay? If you paid attention, and that unfortunately is something that happens in the battles of old, we won, but at a cost, because you know we started with one set of player carries a flag, they got killed right away, no problem. Another set of players captured the flag before and ended up on the ground and, and carried across, right? So therefore, what is the relationship of these players? Similar in this kind of uh, um, civil war battle, None. These were totally different people. In fact, they are actually totally different number. Because remember, we self-select these people at random by a lottery. So sometimes we shoot for a thousand, but sometimes it can be 100, uh, 1,100, sometimes it can be 150, and so on and so forth. And they have no shared variable between. They didn't know each other. They didn't agree on anything. But they had a shared environment. And this is enough to behave as if we were a single protocol. That's why the system works. Somebody proposes a block, again, selected by random lottery. Another random special lottery with no communication, extremely efficient, is selected to select a thousand of people. They speak once, different of of people, they speak once, different of people, they speak once. In nine of these things, we are done. And we can rely on the block right away. Many thanks for this initial year to, to Sergey, uh, to Vinodo for having uh, done even a better version of this uh, protocol, uh, to Jing for uh, with whom we are writing our formal paper of this, and actually um, with um, uh, Yossi, Rotem, uh, Georgios, and Nikolai for uh, actually testing these ideas, which are uh, uh, system people at MIT, who said, you know, this is uh, too good to be true. Let's see if it really works. Do you mind? I said, oh, I don't mind. You know. I believe in mathematics, but you know, I know we also believe in mathematics, but sometimes there are all these uh, grungy things that can happen, so let's test it out. So we tested out uh, up to 500,000 uh, users, and uh, the system um, is essentially, it behaves uh, the, way, the way it should. All right. So let me actually say that uh, there are some closest comparisons with uh, some tech. Uh, by the way, this. This approach of Algorand, I think it is an ideal proof of stake product, not a traditional one, right? I mean, it's not a delegated proof of stake. In a delegated proof of stake, at least in my opinion, is another concentration of power. We, we choose uh, 21 people to, to be in charge of defining the block for a while. You know, they could be attacked by the adversary, which is quite concentrated. We could also put some chips in the middle of the table if we misbehave, right, which is our stake. This can be confiscated. Well, you know, I'm not convinced that this works either. And uh, the reason is it might work, but you know, I'm a cryptographer, right? So what I'm going to believe, how much of your disposable income can you afford to push in the middle of a table and not touch it? You cannot touch it. You cannot invest it. You cannot spend it. You cannot do anything. No, really? Well, maybe I can afford 1% to put in such condition in front of a table. So philosophically, the danger is that the only people who can actually push money in the middle of the table are the bad people. And why their million is going to be confiscated? See, they care if they can make a billion. Right? I mean, so, so 
Let me describe this other approach. We are not uh, like this. We are very distinct. One is Robros, and is not proof or wrong. And uh, as the idea also of a small committee, but in their case, the small committee has to be elected the next small committee. So they don't self-select themselves, right? They go around. And so the point is that they must assume that they remain honest for long enough, and uh, something like 50,000 rounds, right? And in any case, is always this long chain, short chain is an eventual uh, consensus, and therefore there is a bit of longer time to confirmation. Another favorite of mine is the Libby consensus, no proof of work. And by the way, this has an elegant proof of correctness. And uh, it uses some of this self-selection, uh, which they kindly also acknowledge. But again, it's an, an eventual consensus. It's not something that you see a block, that's it, you can bet on it right away. In sum, Algorand has no forks, no miners, no proof of work, no weight of confirmation. As a trivial computation, a perfect scalability and great security. In addition, there are things that we should want to have. By the way, as no forks, as I said, or one in the lifetime of the universe. But if we allow one fork every 10 years, which I think we could, then the system becomes even faster. Well, not bad to know. Actually, we can introduce incentives. It's almost we don't need incentives because it's not incentives are, are so needed like in Bitcoin. Right? If, if you do enormous amount of work, somebody has to reimburse you for your expenses. But here, for doing trivial work, you have a, 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 you need to reimburse very little. But we could do incentives. But actually, we can actually have secure incentives because when you actually incentivize people for doing what you want, people see money. Once they see money, they don't care what you want. They want to maximize their money. And they're going to take the system in a totally different direction. So for instance, I do not believe if Mr. or Mrs. or Vina Camoros intended to have miners in the way they exist today. Right? They are a sub-product of these incentives. So we can actually have a secure incentive with a proof that they don't interfere and actually secure it against partition. And one that I'd like to mention, because it was mentioned today, is flexible governance without hard forks. OK. Let me tell you what I believe in. I believe that no battle plan survives the first shot. On the table, my artillery goes this, they cover it, they do it. <laughs> but as soon as a boom, somebody shoots at me, and then it rains, which I didn't expect, and then the hill is a bit more muddy than I thought. So things had to change, right? And what is a cryptocurrency? Is an ocean liner on an automatic pilot. It can move. Or if you move, you have a hard fork. I want to tell you, at least at an intuitive level, why it is very easy in Algorand to have actually flexible governance. Because remember, we can elect this committee for free and I've let them agree on a block, but we can agree on anything we want. Immediately, with the same simplicity, we can agree, for instance, on a change of rules. And we can say that a certain change of rules require a 75% majority. So these 1,000 elected people are our proxy to see if the community agrees. Once you know that 75% of the majority of, of the people agree on the thing, you'd be dumb not to follow it, because otherwise you end on the short part of the stick, which you don't want to do. In any case, and there are also other properties. I want to finish by saying that I'm very much of an admirer of infrastructure. Novel ones, like the ones we're dealing with, and old ones. But I believe that is a, a famous um, uh, bridge in, uh, in Provence that has been in continuous operations since three years before Christ, OK? And until 2005, it carried trucks and cars. Like nobody thought about it. It was so indestructible that people let them go through. So I believe that the distributed ledger is going to be as beautiful and as a useful infrastructure to us to cement ourselves as humanity as any other infrastructure we ever see. And in fact, if we build it correctly, it's going to hold the planet up for a long, long time. This job was, of course, that of Mr. Atlas, but you know, after so long, he looks a little bit tired. So let's give him a rest and let's take matters in our own capable hands. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvio. So we have about four minutes Q&A. Anybody's interested? 
So you say there's no proof of work in Algorand, but it seems like the committee selection is based on a lottery. Is that not just proof of work in disguise? No, no. because a proof of work really, the, the, the terminology miners is very well chosen. Because you really, if you ever tried to break rock with a, a pike, it is a very extraneous thing. Instead, the, the algorithm lottery is essentially is a digital signature, one hash and one comparison. But I wouldn't call it that work. But, so, I mean, if I'm breathing, yes, but I'm not <laughs> working, exerting, right? So that, that is a very, um, nobody's going to waste you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in electricity to do this lottery. It's uh, not, not even, uh, it's even less than a fraction of a cent. Oh, okay. Hello? <clears throat> so. Yeah, wait, wait, one second. Right here first. There's, is, one, there's, there's one here. Go ahead, go ahead. One quick question. So, um, um, so the so there's a, a block proposer that has one proposer, but there's a committee of signers, and the committee is a sub-selection of the total number of signers, like a million signers, right? Yeah. So for a single committee signer, what is their stake? What do they have to lose if they do the wrong thing? Um, so I can probably bribe every one of those committee signers with a thousand bucks to sign the wrong thing, which means every block is only a thousand times the number of committee signers of worth of security because they're individually all bribable and there is a no, tragedy in no. the situation. I made a bad job explaining, and uh, but I can try again. So perhaps <laughs> the second time I'm going to be more clear. Remember, you, if you are an adversary for the time being, okay, so maybe Ronen, you don't mind being an adversary. So if Ronen is the adversary, he would love to corrupt a thousand people. How much can it cost him, right? A thousand bucks each, as, as uh, Joe said, right? The point is that Ronen does not know who the committee members are. It's because you have your own lottery, and after I get the, the, the ticket, so that is not so, so simple. That is the question one. If you have other question. I, well, it's not, I don't need to know who to corrupt because I can say all of the committee members, I don't care when you're going to get uh, selected later. But all of you, if you install this compromised version of Algorand, oh, yes. when the timing that, that is right. That is another thing, which, you know, somehow you and I have always uh, to agree, like everybody else, oh, what does honesty mean, okay? So do you know what is the most ancient type of protocol in cryptography ever? Secret sharing. We all know what it means, right? I'm afraid to lose my password. So what am I going to do? I which is a number, right? I'm going to take, break it down into 10 numbers, whose sum is mine, right? And I choose the first number totally at random, the second number totally at random. And I started giving you a number to you, a number to George, a number to you, to you, to you, to 10. What I'm going to ask you, please, if you are honest, don't tell anybody, right? But if I need it because I forgot my password, give him a number and I sum them up. That is cryptography 101 invented you know, from time immemorial. Now, by the same token, you are going to say, oh, this password system, secret sharing, does not work. And therefore, nothing of protocol works. Because if I am coming on an adversary and say, I'm here buying you know, your pieces of any secret password done in the world. So I, I know that you call this honest. You call yourself honest. I give you also peace of mind. I absolve you of your doing this. Consider yourself honest and give me the secret you own. If, you are, if we believe that people will, who, who volunteer this, you know, are called themselves honest. I think uh, a lot of cryptography suddenly disappears. All of racial cryptography disappear. Multi-party computation disappear. So I think that, you know, first of all, uh, practically convenient, you, you give a customer also a custom-wrapped uh, protocol. And then if you are going to say, but I'm honest, the first thing I'm going to do, I unwrap it. I'm going to substitute things so that I can alert and provide my input to, to an adversary, and I want to call myself honest too. You know, I cannot have my cake, my cake and eat it. Uh, I can have my cake and eat it too. So I think that you know, honesty 101, that I would consider dishonest, and now I don't think I'm alone. Thank you. Thanks.